Let's start off by talking about something we don't like to think about and talk about, but when I say failure or your greatest failures, what, what comes to mind? What are those failures that come to mind? I don't know about you, but I think back to my high school years and I think, oh, I was so awkward. There's those cringe-worthy moments. Where I'm so glad nobody had you know, cameras on phones back then, you know, back in the ancient days, so you could record those moments, right? Cringe-worthy. And then I think in college and some of the things I said and did and poor choices I made, again, poor relationships I was in, it's just cringe-worthy moments. I just, again, I, I cringe at some of those poor choices and failures. And then I think of as a young adult, you know, and poor choices, again, cringe-worthy. And then as a married person, and, and then as a parent, as a Christian, as a pastor, man, I've got a whole long list of failures, you know, that I can look upon. How about you? What are those failures that come to mind when I mention them? It might not have been so long ago. It might have been today or, or this past week. And I, I share that because, have you noticed this? When people share their stories about successes and failures, how we tend to identify more with the failures than successes. For example, if someone was up here talking about how, again, amazing they were, captain of the football team, basketball team, baseball team all at once, and they're also like, you know, the valedictorian and, you know, top employee, sales leader, maybe started their own company, CEO, you know, at the age of 30 or whatever it is, the track record it is. When you share that, you're like, good for them, but you can't really identify, right? But if I share that, man, I've, at times I felt like a failure as a parent. At times I felt like a failure as a Christian. At times I felt like a failure in terms of a married person. You know, if I shared stories like that, I think there are a lot of us who can identify with that because there's something about failure we identify with, but success is a little bit harder. And the reason why you and I can identify with it is because we've all failed. We're all sinners. We're all broken. Some of you may have also heard of that saying, you know, we learn more from failures and we learn from success, more from success. I actually agree with that. I think when we succeed, it's really easy to take credit for it. Like, it's because I worked hard or I studied hard or I got even luckier or whatever it is. But when we fail and we hit rock bottom and we're in that place of just being overwhelmed, it's, it's, we're humbled. And oftentimes it's in those moments of failure we say, God, I'm sorry. Or it's in those moments of failure, we say, God, I, I just really need you, God, to help me through this. I don't know how I'm going to get through this. So we do. I think we can, not always, but we can learn more from failures. But the thing is this, I've also noticed, I'd rather learn honestly from success. I think that's wisdom. I don't want to have to learn from failures every time. And the problem with learning from failures is sometimes when we fail, and de depending on the extent of that failures, we can feel defined. Have you ever felt defined by a failure? by that relationship, you, you know, poor choice you made in high school or college, or again, the way you were failed and financially, maybe as a young adult, or, or way you failed in your career in some ways. And then you can feel defined by that. Not only defined by that, you can feel defeated. I don't know about you, but there have been seasons I just felt defeated as a parent because it just was not turning out the way I expected it to turn out. I felt like, God, if I do this, I thought the promise was you would do this. And at times I just felt defeated. And sometimes it feels like you've ever felt this way, that your failures are sort of like this weight on you, that you're just carrying around all the time, and, and you put up a brave face, and you, you just tell everyone, I, I, you know, you, you look like you're completely fine, everything's going well, but you know the truth, that you have these failures that you've never gotten over, and you just sort of drag around with you. And if you felt that way, or if you feel that way today, I'm so glad you're here. Because truly, God's grace is greater than your failures. In fact, we're in a message series called Greater Than, and we've been talking about how God's grace is greater than our doubts, greater than our sin, and today we're going to talk about how God's grace is greater than our failures. And God's grace, by the way, because we're from different backgrounds, some of us been to church a lot, some of us haven't, you've heard that term thrown around when we talk about grace, just want to give us a common working definition so we're all on the same page. When I say God's grace, we're talking about God's undeserved favor. It means receiving what you and I deserve or don't deserve. It's receiving something that we can't earn in our own strength, but God gives it to us anyway. So if you'd have, like to follow along in your Bibles today, we're going to be looking at John, book of John in New Testament, the Gospel of John chapter 21, and just a few short verses here, 15 to 19. Um, the verses will also be on the screen, so feel free to follow along on the screen, whatever's most comfortable for you. 
And if you're new to church, coming back to church, also want to let you know you don't have to do anything at all. We're just glad you're here. We hope you have a great experience. You come back again and get to know us and this Jesus whom we love and whom we follow. Today, we're going to be looking at probably one of the greatest failures in the New Testament, one of the greatest heartbreaking failures in the New Testament. And we're also going to see how Jesus covered it with his grace. And it's my hope today, before we start talking, before I start talking about this, my hope is that by the end of the short time that we have together, that some of you here, if not many of you, who have felt defined by your failures, defeated by your failures, feeling like that failure is dragging you down everywhere you go, I pray and hope that you would find freedom in Christ. That we recognize again that his grace is greater than our failures and you walk in the freedom that he's promised you and he's promised me. So to give you a little bit of context of what we're gonna be looking at, we're gonna look at some other verses before we look at uh, that passage in, in John chapter 21. The night Jesus was betrayed, you know, that Passover, that he had actually a meal with his disciples and at the end of that Passover meal, he gave him a heads up, and he gave him a heads up quite a few times that, hey, I'm going to be arrested, I'm going to be killed, third day I'm come back again. But again, the disciples didn't understand, and, and this time at the Passover meal, at the end of it, he told them, gave him a heads up, hey, when I'm arrested, when the shepherd is struck, all the sheep are going to scatter. You guys are going to leave me in my greatest time of need. He shared that with the disciples. And then the disciples, I'm sure in their hearts, probably said, there's no way, Jesus, we love you. We're so thankful for you. There's no way. We're gonna, we've got your back, Jesus. But Peter would be the one, oftentimes he was the spokesman for the group of disciples, the 12 disciples, and he was also the most outspoken. He was that guy, you know, maybe it's you, maybe you know someone like that, who speaks before they think, who oftentimes puts their foot in the mouth as the say, saying goes. That's me, and some of you can identify with that, and that was actually Peter. And I, th I think that's why we can identify with him as well as admire him. So this is what Peter says in response to what Jesus said in Matthew 26, 33. Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. It's like all these losers pose, no, he didn't say it that way, but all these guys fall away. I'm your man, Jesus. I'm with you to the end. And he says this, you know, very outspoken way, very publicly here in front of all the disciples, even though the disciples may have been thinking it, he says it out loud. And then some of you are also familiar with what happens next. As Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, Judas leaves the, the uh, soldiers to arrest Jesus. And then Jesus is taken to the religious leaders and questioned, right? And then, you know, the Peter, there's a story of Peter where he sort of sneaks around, lurks, sort of goes to, to see what's happening with Jesus. And then one of the servants says to Peter, hey, aren't you with that guy Jesus? And then Peter lies, because that's what we do when we're scared and we get caught sometimes. We lie. And so he lies and says, no, I don't, I don't know the guy. I don't know. You're, com you're confusing me with someone else. And the second time, another servant comes later and says, hey, aren't you with that guy Jesus? And then he, the second time, he takes it up another level. He's like, too much attention on him, so he swears an oath. I, I swear to God, I do not know him. So again, another lie. And the third time someone says, hey, aren't you with that guy Jesus, we're told that he begins calling down curses on himself. He begins cursing. And by the way, that doesn't mean he's using profanity, like the F word or something like that. He's not saying that. It means he's saying basically to them very passionately, you know, I swear to God, I don't know him. If I'm lying, may God strike me dead. That type of curse. If I'm lying, may God strike me dead. So that's how panicked he was because he was so scared that what they did to Jesus, they would do to him. And as soon as he denied Jesus the third time, we're told this. Luke writes this in Luke chapter 22. Then uh, the Lord turned and looked straight at Peter, the Lord here being Jesus. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him earlier that night. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and he wept bitterly. I remember as a new Christian when I read this, every time I read this, I would weep. <laughs> I was so broken for Peter. I was so broken because can you imagine how broken his heart must have been to weep like that? That he had betrayed his best friend, his teacher, his master. In his moment of greatest need, he turned his back on Jesus. Not only turned his back like the other disciples, because to be fair, all the other disciples as well fled when Jesus was in need during this time. 
Peter had said so many times he's gonna be with Jesus, stand for him, and not only did he deny him, he denied him three times very publicly. And I think this broke him. I think he was a deeply broken man. Even after he saw the resurrected Jesus three days later, he was a broken man. And so he wept bitterly. So we fast forward, and some of you know this story. You fast forward, Jesus comes back, he shows up in the room uh, with the disciples. A week later, he shows up later when Thomas is there. And then now the disciples are waiting for Jesus on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And they're waiting for him because Jesus has told him to go there. And so as they're waiting, they do something that they always used to do. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Verse 15, John chapter 21. When they had finished eating, I'm gonna pause mid-sentence a couple of times to give you a little context. They being the 11 disciples and Jesus. And they'd been eating a meal that some of you know this story as well, Jesus had prepared for them. He had cooked up a meal of some fish and some bread on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And then these guys, again, also brought some fish they'd caught, which goes back to why were they fishing as they waited for Jesus? Well, John writes earlier in verse three of that same chapter, I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. So as they're waiting for Jesus to show up, we're not sure why they went out to fish. Maybe they were bored. Maybe they missed fishing because most of these guys were used to be fishermen. That was their job back in the day. Maybe they were hungry. They wanted to catch some fish, but they go out to fish. And when they go out to fish, they fish all night because back then you would fish at night when the water was cooler because during the day the water would be warm and the fish would go deeper. So they would go out at night and fish and they catch nothing. And do you remember that first time that they met Jesus? And I realize some of you are new to church, coming back to church, you may not know this story, but they had been fishing all night before they met Jesus. They caught nothing as well. And then Jesus told them to throw their net in a certain place. They pulled up so much fish, their nets were breaking. So the similar thing happens here. It's like Jesus is taking them back to the beginning. Specifically, I think he's taking Peter back to the beginning when he first met Jesus. It's like a do-over, like a reset, because that's exactly what Peter needed because he was so deeply broken based on what he had experienced. So they caught nothing. And then Jesus shows up on the shore, tells them to throw a net somewhere. They again pull up this net full of fish. Peter jumps out of the boat, goes to Jesus, all these things, again, they eat. And then after they have this meal, um, Jesus is gonna talk to them. But why is this important? Well, because scholars say that they think that Peter might have been fishing because he was going back to fishing for fish. Next slide, please. That he was gonna give up fishing for people. Why? I don't know about you, but that kind of epic failure would make me doubt whether I was really cut out to be a follower of Jesus. You ever feel that way? You ever feel like you failed so badly, you've fallen back into old habits and sins and addictions, you get to that place where you go, I don't think I can be a Christian, Lord. I failed so miserably, I I, I don't know how I could show up to church. I I don't know how I could go to small group. I don't know how I'm gonna get up and serve today, whatever it is, you just feel like you're unworthy, right? Because again, these failures sort of define us, discourage us, defeat us, whatever it is. And so I wonder what Peter, and again, nobody knows for sure, when you and I get to heaven, you can ask him, hey, Peter, when you went fishing, were you thinking about walking away from Jesus and being a disciple and going back to your old profession? You can ask him that. I definitely would like to. And maybe he was gonna give up fishing for people because that's how deeply broken he was by his very public failures in denying Jesus three times. And so Jesus makes them a meal. I love that. He is the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords but he cooks a meal for them, a warm meal of some fish and bread, we're told in the earlier uh, verses. And then after they're done eating, Jesus speaks to Simon Peter. Chances are the other guys were around, but he zeroes in on Peter because Peter needs Jesus more than those other guys in this moment. And he calls him this. He said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John. Let me pause again mid-sentence here. Simon, son of John was Peter's original name. This was what he was called before he met Jesus. Once he met Jesus, Jesus changed his name. But up to this point, this is his old name. This is who he was before he met Jesus. And again, it seems like Jesus is pushing the rewind button and going back to the very beginning, sort of a reset in terms to help Peter um, process his pain, process his failure, 
and experienced God's grace covering it. That's what we're going to look at today. And then he asks him, after he calls his name, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? He asks him, do you love me more than these? Scholars have been wrestling for ever since Jesus said this. What does he mean by more than these? What is he referring to? He may be referring to the men around him. Do you love me more than these men love me? Because Peter was the one who said, right? If all these guys, fools, fall away from you, Jesus, not me. (laughs) I got your back. I'm with you always. You can count on me. I wonder if it's coming full circle. Do you love me more than these men love me? Or maybe referring to his fishing profession. Do you love me more than looking, pointing to the boat and the nets and all this? Today, he might be asking us today in the midst of our struggles and failures and doubts as well. Do you love me more than your job? Do you love me more than your hobby? Do you love me more than this person? Do you love me more than this addiction? Do you love me more than this brokenness and failure in your life? Do you love me more than these? Chances are he's referring to the men, but we don't know exactly. And then Peter responds, and I think he's genuine because he's been humbled, he's been broken, And he's seen the man he, again, assumed would stay dead, come back to life. And at this point, he knows that Jesus is not just a good teacher and a rabbi, but he is the son of God. He is divine. He says, yes, Lord, master, he said, you know that I love you. You know this, Jesus. He's saying, you know what's in my heart because you are God and you know it. So he doesn't have to say more. He doesn't go on a long sort of explanation of this is how, you know, I love you. It's very simple. He says, You know what's in my heart. You know that I love you, Jesus. And then Jesus' response is very interesting because then Jesus doesn't argue with him. He says, next, then Jesus said, feed my lambs. To which, if you're new to church or coming back to church, again, watching this online, maybe something like this for the first time, you're like, well, Jesus had a farm and he had farm animals and he wanted Peter to take care of his animals? Is that what he's asking him to do? This past week was my uh, wife and I, we celebrated our 27th wedding anniversary. And uh, we went to San Luis Obispo for a few days, just again to get away. And they have a barn there and they have all these animals and all these wonderful sort of things. And so my wife was just having the time of her life, you know, just hanging out with the animals and and doing all sorts of stuff. But that's not what Jesus is talking about because we saw lambs as well there. He's not talking about actual animals. Jesus says he is the good shepherd. And when he was saying he was a good shepherd, he's referring to us, those of us who know him as his sheep. And in the Old Testament, God referred to himself as the shepherd and the nation of Israel as the sheep. So when he's saying, feed my lambs, he's saying, take care of my people. Be a pastor, be a shepherd to my people. And he's basically saying, you know, if you love me, you'll you'll love others. He says this over and over. We love Jesus by loving others. That's the new command he gave to us. And then, you would think, okay, got it, Jesus. Got the memo, we're good to go. I'm gonna go back. I'm not gonna go fishing. I'm gonna go back to you know, being your disciple, a shepherd to your people. But we notice here in verse 16, and some of you know what's gonna happen here. He says, again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? Is it because Jesus didn't believe what he was saying? Was Jesus doubting Peter? No, that's not it. I think he asks this question, and sometimes he asks us the same thing. Sometimes, again, when you pay attention to God, he seems to bring up the same thing over and over, and the reason he brings up the same thing is because healing is a process. It's not like an instantaneous thing, especially those deep scars from your childhood, from broken relationships, things that have hurts that have happened. If they're significant enough, it's not like an instantaneous thing. It can be because God is God. But in my own experience, it is a journey of sanctification and healing that he leads us on because he loves us. And we see here just in a sort of a compact way in this this incident, it feels like it's a journey. And he says it again because he loves Peter and he wants Peter to fully process and heal from and find freedom from, again, this epic failure. Again, he calls him Simon, son of John his original name. Again, it's like a reset, comes back to the beginning. Later, by the way, you know he'll be named, Jesus changed his name to Peter. In Greek, it's Cephas, which means the rock, the rock upon which the church was gonna be built. He was gonna be a leader in the early church. And Peter answered, again, genuinely, humbly, honestly, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. You know that I love you. You know what's in my heart. 
And then Jesus says something slightly different this time. He says, Jesus said, take care of my sheep. Feed my lambs, take care of my sheep. He's again saying, you know, you love me by loving others. But every time he's saying, feed my lambs or take care of my sheep, it's like he's restoring Peter. He's reinstating Peter. You know, sometimes you and I, you know, we, we need to hear these words from God over and over because we are so deeply broken. We are, we've defined ourselves by our sin, our failures, our addiction, our brokenness, so that when God speaks, sometimes he, because he knows we need it, he'll say it over and over. And in Peter's case, he's also saying it over and over because how many times did Peter deny Jesus? Three times. We'll find out here, Jesus ministers to Peter, says the same thing three times. Not to beat him up, but because he needed to find complete he healing and freedom from this epic failure. Take care of my sheep. And the third time, he said to him, Jesus speaking to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Again, he's not the rock yet. He's Simon, son of John. He takes him right back to the beginning before he started following Jesus, that same name. And because this really happened, and this is because it would, you would feel this way and I would feel this way as well in that situation, because we feel like we've already told Jesus, I'm sorry, and, and forgive me, and, and Lord, I just, I love you. It says Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? I think you and I would be hurt as well. Jesus, do you doubt my love for you? Jesus, are you, have you not forgiven me for these three times that I've you know, denied you publicly? Is Jesus just trying to make Peter feel bad? Again, if you look at Jesus and, and his personality and what he taught, that's not it. Jesus doesn't make us feel bad. He doesn't guilt you, shame you, beat you up. He's trying to help Peter here find healing from his failures. So he reminds him again, what, what matters the most, Peter? Your performance or your love for me? And he brings him back. What matters the most is our love for him, love Jesus. And what matters second, he says, love others. Love Jesus, love people. And so he brings Peter back. And again, why is he repeating it? For those reasons, I think. And I'm not completely sure. In fact, you could read a bunch of scholarly articles and no one's completely sure why Jesus says it three times. But that's my best guess. And then he said, even though he was hurt, he responded, Lord, Master, you know all things. Notice here, he doesn't say, you know me. You know what's in my heart. He says, God, you know all things. You are God, basically. And you know that I love you. It's very clear. And I think Peter's getting the memo, the message, like, okay, I see what Jesus may be trying to do. You know all things. You know what is in my heart. And Jesus, again, he says something. The first time was feed my lambs. Second time, take care of my sheep. Third time, feed my sheep. You love me by loving others. And every time again he's saying this and Peter's responding, not only is he healing Peter and his grace covering his failure, it's like he's restoring him, reinstating him to be the disciple and the leader of the early church. And then Jesus gives him a little preview of what's to come as he takes care of his lamb, his sheep, his church. He says, I tell you the truth. And whenever he says, I tell you the truth, it's always like, hey, focus. This is important. Just want to give you a heads up what it means to, to feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, to feed my sheep. This is what it's going to look like. Just give you a heads up. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. To which we're like, okay, what is he exactly saying? But I'm so grateful because then John tells us what Jesus was trying to say to Peter. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. This is how he would die. And some 30 years later, we know history tells us, whether you believe, again, Jesus is real or not, or he came back from the dead or not, we have enough historical data to show us that Peter was killed for his faith. All the disciples were killed for their faith. And he was crucified by the Emperor Nero, we believe somewhere around AD 65 to 67. So can you imagine that? Like as Jesus is reinstating Peter, he says, hey, heads up. At some point, you're going to die as a result of following me. You know, someone's gonna stretch out your hands on a cross. Someone's gonna lead you where you don't wanna go. Someone's gonna dress you to get ready to die. And, and basically, we know from history, there's some legends that say 
He refused to be crucified like Jesus, so he wanted to be hung upside down, crucified. Uh, we're not sure if that's real or not, but we do know he was killed by Nero for his faith in Jesus. And after giving him that heads up, because 30 years Peter would follow him, if Peter would serve as a leader of the church and do what Jesus said, these are the last words that we're gonna focus on in our time together. Then he, being Jesus, said to Peter, follow me, follow me. In the original Greek language, it means keep on following me. It's in the present imperative. So keep on following me. And I wonder if he says that to us today. In the midst of your failures, in the midst of your setbacks, in the midst of your doubts, in the midst of your sin, keep on following me. Don't give up. My grace is greater than your failures. Just like Peter. I mean, he failed in ways probably we can or maybe cannot identify with. But again, at the end of it, he says, come follow me. And it reminds me, again, full circle. It goes back to the very beginning in Matthew 4.19 when Jesus said this to him and the other disciples. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. In spite of his failures, in spite of, again, all that happened, when he says this, he's reinstating and restoring Peter because God's grace is truly greater than your failures. Let me ask you this, because I don't know your stories, I don't know where you're at spiritually, but have you allowed your failures to define you? Have you allowed your failures to make you feel like you've just, again, you're defeated? Or are you dragging these failures around? Or have you responded to Jesus' call to follow him? Follow him in the midst of that and experience his grace. I love Romans 8.28 as I ask the praise him to come back up. I love this verse because I fall back on this in the midst of my failures, in the midst of my brokenness, in the midst of the things I've experienced. Paul writes this, the Apostle Paul in Romans 8.28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. In all things doesn't mean just the good things. All things doesn't mean just the positive things. All things means the failures, the shame, the brokenness, all those things that we hope no one ever finds out about us. You know what? God can redeem it. His grace can cover it because he's greater and we can grow from it. As the praise team leads us, you don't have to, you don't want to, but would you take a moment, would you respond to his grace? Would you respond to his grace? Are you walking in freedom today knowing you're forgiven, you're covered by his grace? Are you dragging behind you a chain of failures and regrets and could haves wish you'd been differently? Would you come before the Lord if you know him and just say, Lord, I'm sorry. Please forgive me and please help me today to follow you. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And my hope for you and my hope for me, because we will fail again because we're sinners. But each time we fail, we would be like Peter. Come before Jesus, say, Lord, I'm sorry. I do love you. Would you help me to follow you? Let's take some time and pray and respond and would you take your struggles before the Lord today and ask him to set you free, whether it's from the past or things in the present or whether it's failures, his grace is truly greater than all these things. Let's pray together. Amen. I will live as a child in awe of you. Love that line. Thank you, AB team. Thank you, Praise Team, for leading us into a wonderful time of worship. I'll leave you with a few optional questions for reflection or discussion. Do you agree that you learn more from failure than success? Why or why not? Why do you think Jesus asked Peter the same question three times? And how can you experience God's grace in the midst of your failures and regrets? Please allow me to pray for us before we go our separate ways. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you so much for Peter's story, for Peter's testimony. I thank you, Lord, that no one, Lord, through that story, you remind us and teach us that no one is beyond redemption, Lord. No one is too damaged, Lord. No one is has failed so badly, Lord God, that you can't redeem him or her, Lord. Your grace truly is amazing, Lord God. And we thank you for Peter's story because it gives us hope, Lord in the midst of our own struggles and failures and our own broken promises and our own lack of obedience at times and faith, 
gives us hope, Lord God, and reminds us that your grace truly is greater than our failures, Lord. I pray today, Lord, that you help us all, those of us who know you, Jesus, to follow you. That, that is something you call us to do daily, not just Sundays, not once in a while. You call us to do it daily, to take up our cross, to deny ourselves, and follow you, Jesus. That we would follow you in the good times, we'd follow you in the bad times. We'd follow you, Lord God, when we fail, we follow you when we succeed. We follow you, Lord God, not because of how we feel or what we can do, but because you love us. And we love you, Lord. And so, Father, I pray, Lord, again, that today we would have a taste, a glimpse of the freedom that comes from knowing you, knowing your great love for us, Lord. That, yes, we will fail. We will mess up, Lord God. But thank you that each and every time we just simply turn to you and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I do love you. Please help me follow you. I pray that's the prayer of every person in this room and those watching online. And then we experience your grace upon grace, Lord, in our lives. And we experience the freedom that comes, Lord God, from that relationship with you, Lord. Not religion, not a list of things we have to do, but a relationship with you, Jesus, a love relationship. So we thank you, Jesus, for loving us. And it is in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. I hope you have a great week. We will see you next week.